In a family that includes such oddities as the flat, childproof keyboard of the Atari 400 and the interesting aesthetics of the Atari XEGS, you'll be surprised to learn that this rather normal looking computer, the Atari 1200 XL, is possibly the most polarizing computer Atari ever released. Let's find out why. Hi, I'm Jacob with Tech Retrospective, and this is the Atari 1200 XL. It's possibly the most pivotal computer in Atari's history. At the same time, it was a terrible flop that left a lot to be desired. To find out how both can be true, we need to look at how this system came to be. Thanks to their numerous successes in the arcade business and their pioneering work in the early days of home video games, Atari was already a household name in 1978 when they announced their next big venture, disrupting the fledgling home computer market with two brand new home computers. These systems were the affordable Atari 400, sporting a rather unique keyboard, and the Atari 800, a high-end system representing the peak of technology for the time. Both of these systems were built on an extremely powerful chipset based around the MOS 6502 processor, offering powerful and flexible graphics and superb sound. If you'd like to know more about the specific hardware used in the 400 and 800, I did do dedicated videos on both of those systems, so make sure to check them out. Now, the platform that those systems were built onto was very forward-thinking, but these systems aren't perfect. The two big issues here were ones that Atari didn't have control over. First was the immaturity of the computer market. Computers hadn't yet been proven to be necessary devices in every household and were still intimidating to the vast majority of consumers. It would take a few more years for the widespread adoption of home computers to catch on. The second issue was price. Now don't get me wrong, these systems were expensive, but they were still a great deal compared to much more expensive setups like the popular Apple II. Still, the power of these systems came with a price tag outside the reach of most consumers. Not helping the situation was that both systems had to adhere to strict regulations set by the FCC regarding RF interferences. In order to pass these restrictions, the entire computer would have to be built inside a metal shell, adding a lot to manufacturing costs that were already quite high thanks to the inclusion of multiple daughter boards in the design. And unfortunately, with starting prices of $550 for the 400 and $1,000 for the 800, sales would be an uphill battle. Both systems would remain fairly popular in their first few years, but it was clear that Atari's platform had not reached its full potential. By 1982, Atari felt the time was right to develop successors to the 400 and 800. Advancements in miniaturization and the relaxing of FCC regulations meant that they had a lot more freedom with their new line's design, but they would have to be quick as the computer industry that had felt wide open just four years ago was getting very crowded with new players like Texas Instruments, Commodore, and even IBM. These new designs were internally called the Sweet 16 Project. Like last time, there would be both a low-end and a high-end model. These were the 16K Atari 1000 and the high-end, no compromises, 64K Atari 1000X. Both systems would fundamentally use the same platform as the 400 and 800, but with some very nice improvements. First would be a drastically simplified board layout, removing the need for daughter boards and consolidating mini chips which would help reduce costs. Second would be general improvements. Things like new commands for controlling the system, a built-in diagnostics test, new function keys, and the ability to access an international character set, which would be essential for selling the line outside of English-speaking territories. These upgrades may seem somewhat minor, but they really added up to make the platform feel modern and complete. Third was the inclusion of an extremely advanced expansion system. 
This system was the killer feature of the new platform and was a big focus for Atari in promotional material. This system would have given users unheard of levels of possibilities. And with the accessory known as the 1090 expansion system, users would gain five additional expansion slots, which then could have even allowed users to make their systems IBM compatible with the right daughter boards. I say would have, because neither the 1000 or the 1000X would ever be released. This was a time period of pure chaos at Atari, and many, many system designs would never see the light of day due to the quickly changing market, the revolving door of new management at Atari, and sheer overambition at a time when Atari was not exactly financially stable. Instead, Atari's next big computer release would be the 1200XL, a Frankenstein of old and new. It would share some of the new changes from the 1000X design, but would be much more in line with being a standard refresh of the 800. The biggest loss would be that of the expansion bus system, as Atari management wanted an enclosed all-in-one box design to separate this new system from the previous generation of computers designed for the hobbyist tinkerer. The idea of expanding a computer was a scary idea to the general public, and it was felt that the feature wouldn't be missed. This would also simplify the design of the system and allow an earlier launch, which was now of desperate concern for Atari as a crisis was beginning to unfold. You see, one of Atari's rivals had released a new system that was proving to be a big problem for them, the Commodore 64. You may have heard of it. The Commodore 64 was released in September 1982 for a price of $595, a price that significantly undercut the 48K Atari 800. In terms of specs, the C64 was pretty on par with the 800. The big difference was that it was much cheaper to produce. If Atari wanted to compete, they would have to begin selling the 400 and 800 at a loss something that would work in the short term, but Atari needed a new system out as soon as possible, which is why they needed the 1200XL, a system with the same RAM total as the Commodore machine, but without some of the more expensive features of the 1000X. It was the best option they had considering the situation, and the Hail Mary could have paid off, in theory, but in reality, the 1200XL was a mess of a system that didn't have a place on the market. It's clear the 1200 was a rush job. A lot of its inefficiencies were caused by its chaotic, reactionary development and fundamentally not knowing who the system was meant for. For one of the best examples, look at the system's video display circuitry. It was a minor change from the 800 design, meant to improve the system's video quality. The signal was improved with much more vibrant on-screen colors, but thanks to the rush design, the contact to the separate chroma circuit that was already designed and part of the motherboard was never connected, leaving the 1200XL with an overall worse video display than the 800. But Atari still needed something out to compete with the new rising star of the C64, so they released the 1200XL in March of 1983 for a starting price of $899, just a little cheaper than what the 800 had retailed for originally, and several hundred dollars more expensive than the C64, which was now receiving drastic price cuts and rebate offers from a very aggressive Commodore. Reviewers at the time liked the quality of the system a lot, but a sentiment that it was an overpriced compromise of a system were omnipresent. The 1200XL was a flop out the gate, costing Atari precious resources and credibility that were already dwindling. Part of the real irony of the 1200 was that its release actually caused a significant uptick in sales of the original 400 and 800 which dealers were now discounting to make room for the new hardware. They ended up being much better deals than the overpriced 1200, 
It didn't help that the 1200 had issues playing a select number of third-party games from the 400 and 800, giving the impression that you were getting less for more. Still, there's a lot to like about the 1200 XL. The many small improvements it made were, in fact, pretty great, and the new case design was wonderful, evident by the fact that it would be reused several times. The 1200 XL also offered one of the best keyboards on the market at the time, offering a smooth, velvety key press. But really, it comes down to the Commodore 64. I firmly believe that if Commodore hadn't been firing on all cylinders, then the 1200 XL would have never existed in the first place, and Atari would have had more time to release their real next generation systems. Who knows what that alternative timeline could entail. In the end, the 1200 XL was cancelled in April of 1983 after being on sale for just four months. And two months after that, in June, Atari would introduce the world to the 600 XL and the 800 XL two new systems that would stick to the design laid out by the 1200 XL, but fixing some of its issues and cutting costs considerably to sell at an actually competitive price point. They technically were downgrades from the 1200, removing the function keys and using a much less premium case and keyboard, but they actually fit into the new market of low-priced computers quite well. And while they wouldn't beat the Commodore 64, which would go on to be the best-selling computer in history, they still would sell quite well, with the 800 XL going on to be Atari's most popular computer ever released. Looking at it with a modern eye, it's pretty clear that the 1200 XL was a bad idea, but it was still in some ways the best bad idea that Atari had when put into such an unwittable situation. At least the 1200 XL has gained appreciation with Atari fans as the cult classic of the line. It's fairly common for those who really, really are into the Atari 8-bit family to replace the 1200 standard operating system ROM with one from an 800 XL, giving them the best of both worlds. The upgraded keyboard alone is worth the purchase, well, if it's functioning. Unfortunately, the keyboard design of the 1200 XL is an issue for collectors as the Mylar connecting the keys to the circuit board degrades over time. It's a fairly common issue that renders the machine unusable. Thankfully, replacement kits can be found pretty easily. Our 1200 XL is actually in need of that treatment. We bought it knowing the keyboard was in need of repair, since we got a great deal paying just $200 for the system when units in fully operational condition can get much more expensive. It also came with some great extra goodies like a compact flashcard reader and a video upscaler. Pretty cool. Overall, I would say that the 1200 is a really interesting computer with a neat story behind it, but I think if you are just picking up your first Atari 8-bit computer, I'd stick to other models. And now for the ratings. Usability, 3 out of 5. It's a nice, usable system once you've dealt with the hardware aging, especially if you take the time to install some aftermarket options. Rarity, 4 out of 5. Given the pathetic lifespan of this system, it's no surprise that it is one of the rarest Atari computers, not counting those that only exist as prototypes, of course. Price, 1 out of 5. Most Atari 8-bit computers remain quite budget-friendly. That's not the case here. This one is for those with deep pockets. Aesthetics, 5 out of 5. Man, Atari got it pretty much perfect with this design. It looks very modern for the time, especially when compared to the Atari 800 or even the Commodore 64. I'm a big fan of the silver accent as well. Great stuff. Software, 4 out of 5. Yeah, it's true that a very small number of titles won't run on the 1200. That's really not a big deal when the Atari 8-bit library is so huge. There's a lot to do here, and the homebrew community is alive and well. Well, that's all I have for you guys today on the Atari 1200XL. We're getting closer to our goal of covering every Atari computer ever released. We've covered quite a few of the Atari 8-bit machines before, so be sure to check those out. And if you'd like to discuss computer history, 
with me or any other dedicated nerds out there, you should join our Facebook group, and I'll see you guys next time.